Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the fifth CETA Technology Series Workshop. My name is Claire Crowley, and I'm chair of the Society of Chartered Surveyors Ireland QS BIM Working Group. The SES are event partner for this workshop, and we're committed to increasing the awareness and knowledge of BIM across the QS profession. The BIM Working Group was set up in 2011 to inform and assist members in getting to know BIM, advising them of the opportunities and challenges within BIM, and to date we've assisted through a number of CPD events and we also had a very successful event last year in DIT, which was a day seminar. We had industry experts over from the UK to give some advice on BIM. At the moment, we're currently working on a guidance note for QSs, just to outline the importance of what BIM is. I think at this stage, everybody is fairly familiar with BIM, the theory of BIM, and we're trying to encourage QSs on getting started in BIM, giving them advice on where to start, so hopefully you'll see that guidance note being issued later this year. The concept of integrated project delivery is being realised now at the moment through the use of BIM. Technologies are being explored predominantly by designers in the Irish market, and the use of BIM within the quantity surveying industry is quite low. Although BIM is slow to develop and expand within the Irish market, it is widespread across the world. The UK are moving fast, mostly due to the government mandate. Now is the time for a financial and training commitment. It's worthwhile and essential. Although the BIM models are not readily available to QSs at this time in Ireland, now is the time to innovate, upscale, adopt and collaborate. Quantities of AIN opportunities do exist and they involve early input and use of the BIM model to provide enhanced optioneering services to clients. They also include potential role of model exchange facilitator, enhancement of the role that we already perform, which is essentially clash detection, and they also could include direction and input into the BIM execution plan. BIM does not mean the end for QSs. It ratifies the requirement for our discipline, and the BIM process requires the expert skills offered by QSs currently in our profession. BIM is not perfect, and the models produced by designers are not either. It's time now for the QSs to get involved in BIM and provide feedback to designers, let them know what we need from the models and how we need the models to work for us to do our jobs correctly. So today's um, presentation, I'm just going to run through the programme. We have a keynote speaker, Trevor Woods, who will come first. Trevor is um, a construction and IT consultant specialist. He has a diploma in construction economics, a Bachelor of Science from Dublin University, and also is stu currently studying the Masters in Construction Informatics in DIT. Trevor has over 20 years experience in the industry and has approximately four years experience working with BIM. He's also a member of our SESI BIM working group. So BIM is go um, Trevor is going to go through today BIM for quantity surveyors and a guide for architects, engineers and 3D modelers on making BIM friendly. He's going to show us how to BIM from a QS perspective. We'll then have some workshop questions and feedback and then we'll move on to Cathy Malloy along with Bernard Vertman who are going to introduce the CLIP pilot presentation and just talk through the work that Cathy has been doing on that. We'll then have the closing address and some networking afterwards. Just like to acknowledge our sponsors today and give some thanks to exactly BIM Reader, Bentley, Enterprise Ireland, Coastway, ArcDocs, Autodesk, and thank them for sponsoring the event today. So I'd like to introduce Trevor now to kick off the events. Start off with an IT professional, I can never find the mouse. Um, BIM. The, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, first question, are there any quantity surveyors in the room? Hands up. Jeez, I'm in shock. I'd have to sit down. First time I've been at a BIM event, I'd say, where there's been more than two QSs. I've been at quite a few of them in the UK and Ireland over the past couple of years. So it's great that finally we have a couple of QSs um, at a, a BIM event. I mean, it, it, it is a very rare sort of occurrence. Um, tied to the presentation, BIM, the good, the bad and the ugly, um, they're all there, not necessarily in equal measure. 
um, and it's trying to focus on it from a QS perspective, but also try and give something to um, architects, engineers and 3D modelers on possibly how they might make BIM models 5D friendly. I mean, a huge problem we have at the moment is that as QS, we simply haven't engaged in the whole debate about BIM. Um, Claire went through my background, yeah, I'm still trying to finish the, the, the CETA Masters in Construction Informatics. Uh, there's a bunch of you in the room, you, you know what sort of a difficult course it is, so it's really, um, that's what got me into the whole area of BIM a couple of years back. Um, I'm doing a bit of lecturing in DIT Boat and Street at the moment, they have a new CPD programme in BIM, Collaborative BIM Technology, so I've been able to inflict myself on QS and Construction Management students for the past uh, five or six months. Um, what is BIM? Why BIM? We're not going to talk about that. I'm sick defining what BIM is and why BIM is good. I mean, I assume you all have a basic understanding of what BIM is and why BIM is being used in the industry. Um, and I've been screaming at events for the past 12 to 18 months. Move the debate on, especially in the UK. It's over. Don't bother defining what BIM is. Don't wonder why BIM is good or how. The debate has to be how. How do you implement BIM? How do you leverage BIM? How do you sweat the investment that's gone into BIM models from a QS perspective? So it's not why or what BIM is. I'm going to try and run you through how BIM should work from a QS perspective. The uh, sort of current state of play, um, February 2013 at the RICS National BIM Conference in London, 49% of respondents stated they were currently not using BIM which to me was great because then 51% were using BIM. Um, in 2011, a more extensive survey by the RICS, 10% of QS were using BIM. Um, all respondents said they'd adopted or actively considering BIM. So everyone at that conference said, yeah, we're at a BIM conference. There's not much of a clue needed that you're interested in BIM. You're looking at it. 46% of respondents identified minimal client demand as a major barrier. But the real kick in the teeth from a QS perspective was only 29% of attendees at an RICS quantity saying conference or QS's on BIM. So we haven't got it. As QS's we really have been um, just haven't gotten the whole BIM thing at all. I mean to me it was shocking to think that at an RICS QS conference 71% of the attendees were not QS's. Um, so the 49% figure of, of adoption and usage is, is an awful lot lower. Anecdotally, from being at events in the UK, the QSs over there are no further ahead than we are here. They're, they're talking about it, implementing BIM, they're talking about doing BIM. I haven't seen too much evidence of it. So we're not far behind. We can very quickly, as an industry here, I think, catch up and probably accelerate past the UK in some instances. Um, and this is what I've been hearing for the past couple of months. It's gotten really bad the past couple of months, it's driving me crazy. QSs are in fear of BIM. Um, every event we were at, we were at an event a couple of weeks back with BIM Glitterati from the UK, the UK BIM crew, and there was two or three presentations and everything was QS's were in fear of BIM. It was at a UK BIM conference a couple of weeks prior to that and the first slide by the keynote speaker was a curve showing four grids and the first grid was QS's in fear of BIM. Um, the perception is that we are in fear of BIM you look at any of the articles on the web and it's all about QSs and how they're going to be done away with and the rise of the machines. Nobody wants my quantities, Robert Klaschke, an architect who spoke at the RICS event last year, said the QSs didn't want his quantities. Uh, and was, this was written in 2006, 2007. Well, I wouldn't want his quantities either from what I've been through the past couple of years. Um, the title, BIM, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. <coughs> Any QS who came here looking for a panacea or looking for a, a cure-all for quantity saying and measurement, you're not going to get that. Um, I'm hoping to try and give a warts and all sort of view of, of, of BIM from a QS perspective. Um, the good from a QS perspective. <coughs> I had the good, the bad and the ugly music, but a glitch couldn't get it to work properly. Another IT glitch. Counting, counting, counting. Huge benefit from BIM for quantity surveying. I mean, I spent the weekend working with one or two individuals here measuring ductwork on a large project in the Middle East um, that was modelled in 3D. Um, models weren't made available, but yet 
I was looking through presentations from that BIM conference at the start of May. What did I find? A presentation on this particular project, how it was done in BIM using Rhino and Revit and the structure was modelled, the facades were modelled, the service were modelled. Models weren't made available. We went through hell measuring ductwork over the weekend. Anyone who's in, interested in measurement, likes measurement, BIM isn't for you. Strongest part about BIM is counting, counting, counting. Objects, lengths, areas, volumes. Um, extracting quantities when they exist, and I'd say when they exist, um, and model elements are categorised and labelled correctly. Um, just because something is in a model doesn't mean that it can be quantified correctly. Um, we'll run through some of that later on. There can be objects in the model which you can just say it's one number. You can't necessarily get the length or width or depth or height or volume. <coughs> Visualisation, huge, huge aspect of it. Uh, being able to spin a building around, being able to look at the foundations or switch on and off layers or see what is the detail there. From a QS perspective, BIM is great in that architects can't hide or engineers can't hide. If you notice on, pro on 2D projects, you never get a section through the stairs or through a difficult junction. Um, with a BIM model, you drop the section where you want. Okay, so that's a huge part of it. Even if you only got visualisation alone out of BIM models, it's, it's a great place to start with some of the free tools that are available out there. Collaboration. Um, huge feature of it. Getting professionals talking. Getting architects talking to engineers, talking to QSs about their processes, about what they have to do and how they produce their work. I mean, very few architects know what QSs actually do. They know what we produce. We're the same as QS as we know what architects produce. We don't necessarily know their workflow or their processes. Um, so I think BIM will be an eye opener in that regard. Um, we'll start breaking down barriers. Um, revisions and model changes, godsend, absolute godsend. I mean, I, I've been working on a large semiconductor project for the past number of months where revisions are coming at me constantly. And being able to use Costex to take a model in and to run it through the process and not have to go back and manually measure is huge, huge aspect of it. If you can get a model, you put the work in, you measure it the first time at tender stage. If you win the job and the model changes, you bring it back in and it will produce your updated quantities again. Right, so that's based on the premise that the model has been constructed in the fashion we can take quantities from. But I mean, those are some of the good points. Um, moving on to <laughs> uh, the bad points. We have um, Angel Eyes, Lee Van Clef here. Stuff uh, that you would expect BIM to do, but it doesn't, or it doesn't do it correctly, or there's some issues with it. Surprisingly, contrary to what architects would tell you, not everything is modelled. Skirtings, architraves, frames, formwork, um, a lot of finishes aren't modelled, carpet, ceramics, um, a lot of smaller accessories and fittings aren't modelled. So not everything is modelled. Still uses 2D details. Now that came up at the event that Arctox and Diotech and the guys organised a couple of weeks back where one of the panel speakers said, look, everything should be in 3D. Forget your 2D details. I mean, why, and I'm sick of getting models where there's very little information in them. The information is all trapped in 2D details in the model itself you still have to go through a manual process of measuring the details and extracting the information. So there's a huge amount of information locked up in 2D details and models at the moment. Uh, and you just need to develop a workflow that you track that information, that it's not missed. My favorite, cryptic descriptions. Um, Bernard has a great one in, in the pilot project. It's, it's tags the roofing accessory, right? but we'll get back to that later on. Um, Unfortunately, with models, whether they're Revit or Archicad or Vectorworks, the information that QSs see is different than the information that the architect would see in the model itself. We see maybe a subset of the information, or we see a little cryptic description. You have to see the object in context to make sense of it. That's why I wouldn't want Robert Klaschke's quantities, where he would give me a spreadsheet with a list of quantities and a list of cryptic descriptions. You need to see the stuff in context. You need to be able to see those quantities back in the model where they've actually come from. I would look at using the architect's schedules for validating my own quantities, but certainly I wouldn't be relying solely on the architect's schedules just to try and fast track the process. 
there's a severe lack of usable information in a lot of models. Um, really, they're boom models. They're building models. They're not building information models. Um, the bad, again, I think there's three or four pages of bad. <laughs> um, you can have issues with duplicate objects. Now, what I was hoping to do, I was hoping to try and illustrate some of these and sitting down over the past couple of days just thinking, Jesus, having to open some old models again and pull out the bad examples. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to drive you to distraction or me to drink. Um, there can be issues where objects are modeled over each other. I mean, you can go in and draw a wall over a wall. Um, and as a QS, we have to come up with workflows to try and detect this. So you're looking at using a tool like something like Navisworks or Celebri um, model checker to go and check for items that are built over each other. Um, structural models and architectural models when they're merged, you can get load bearing walls model in the structural model, load bearing walls model in the architectural model that you have to be aware of. That you don't just push a button and have your quantities extracted um, and have double the wall quantities. It's great if you're a contractor, but if you're a QS who's producing the bill of quantities, you know, you're paying him twice for something that he's doing once. Um, on categorized MEP systems, I uh, worked on a project with, with Redis, it was a large um, stadium in the Middle East, and I thought, brilliant, we have, a, we have a Revit model, super, all the MEPs in it. All of the pipe work in the model was categorized as hydroponic piping system. We spent two days going through and lassoing stuff on screen and trying to retag it. We didn't have the native model file again, we had a DWFX file. So if you're an MEP designer, please tag your systems. Tag them as different systems, tag them as chilled water, tag it as drainage, tag it as plumbing, hot and cold water services. Small amount of work makes a huge difference to the QS uh, down the line. Um, objects not categorised by location. Large project might be split into three or four buildings. If you can tag them simply with a tag saying that it's in this block or this block, it makes a huge difference. Stairs. You think, great, we don't have to measure stairs anymore. We do. <laughs> It'll tell you there's one number, or there's two numbers, or there's three number, and here's the waist, and here's the treads, and here's the risers. Uh, some models I've worked with, you don't get the volume of concrete. You have to do a manual measurement on the actual uh, string detail and try and work out the volume of concrete, unless it's precast and you can say one number and give a nice description. Um, project I worked on with Ralph a couple of years ago, it didn't do T-shaped windows very well. If the window was actually modelled as a T-shaped window, it wasn't deducting out the correct volume from the wall, it was deducting out the principal part of the T, not the, not the wings. Um, cladding or curtain wall quantities, and we just checked that it's not doubling up the measurement, that it's not taking the, 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 the gross area, the front, back and sides. I've seen that in a couple of models. Um, so just as QSs, our role is validation, validation, validation. You still do the checks and balances. You still need to check. You can't just assume that it's correct because it's in a model. Um, wall areas. The wall area and how soft, different software calculates it uh, depends on how the wall is joined. If it's a butt joint or a mitre joint, you're going to get different quantities. If you split the wall up into, if it's if it's um, the wall is a component or it has a couple of different layers in it, how the wall joins has a big big sort of an impact. Uh, wall gables. You need to watch out. Has the gable actually been cropped by the roof or is it is it increase in the quantity. Stacked walls are, are another issue. We had an issue on that stadium project with the regular shaped floor slabs. Um, now I think that was down to software being sent out into a structural analysis package and being brought back in. So if you get any sniff on a project that the structural model has been routed into an analysis package, just raise a red flag, just really check your quantities from the structural model. Rebar, I haven't seen the model yet with rebar in it. We're still working at so many kg per cube or whatever it is. Slabs and columns, um, that, that structural model, that stadium model, we had an issue where slabs and column joins weren't, they were the slab, or the column was running into, running into the slab. Um, I think we noticed it at ground floor where we had a, a major big raft, I think it was maybe one or two meters deep. Pad foundation was running through the raft but it wasn't deducting out the quantity. It was only, we had a cost plan from a previous phase of the project. We could go back and check our quantities against it. But we think the problem there was that it, the structural analysis was done in another third party package. It was brought back into 
the BIM design tool and there was issues. So it's just to check, you have to validate your quantities. You still have to validate. The architect pushing them at the BIM BQ button and producing quantities, fine, let them off. You need to check, you know, the QS skill needs to be used to check the actual quantities. Uh, I went into part of the ugly there, but th this is uh, 3D solids, morphs, transforms. Architects are creating a um, design model. They're creating a product model, a model of the finished product. Uh, they're modeling objects as 3D solids. Um, an example on one of the student projects in DIT, I did some work on it to do a cost estimate on for Dublin City Council last week. The guy had modeled these wonderful balconies. Um, lots of circular hollow section, lots of metal decking, lovely glass handrail. It was in the model as one solid object, so you got 16 number objects. Um, you had to go back in, manually measure on screen the length of the steel members. You had to measure the area of the actual deck, the length of the handrails themselves. Because it was modelled as a 3D solid, it was just Bernard's model on the pilot project, not picking on Bernard, but one of the roofs in the existing model, it's, it's modelled as, as, as um, um, a morph or a transform. So it can't be quantified. All we get from that is the perimeter of it. As a QS, you get the perimeter. You'd need to go in and do um, a 3D measurement on screen in Costex or one of the other tools. Um, bad quantities. This sort of shook my faith in BIM for, for a couple of minutes. Um, working on that stadium project, very, very extensive curved roof. Um, and the QS who worked on it had measured this thing manually uh, on the previous phase of the project, a year prior to that, where I'd been rambling on about BIM and how great it was. And he measured it manually. We measured it using the model when it came back in. The steel volumes were half what they should have been. So there was some issue with it being rooted out into another application uh, and being brought back in again. But it was just that we validated back against the previous cost plan. Um, and that gave us the confidence to say, yes, the steel was right. We had a benchmark. Um, IFC, industry foundation classes, there's as many different BIM products as there are months in the year or days in the week or days in the year. Um, they all have their own proprietary file formats. This file format called IFC, industry foundation classes, is a vendor neutral format, um, which is designed to allow you exchange models between different applications. Um, implementation in some applications is dreadful. Implementation from a QS perspective is dire. Um, it only maps certain objects from the, 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 um, the model. It doesn't have an object for roofs. It doesn't have an object for, um, I think it was stairs, or there was one or two other objects that aren't actually mapped. So all of your roofs all come in as slabs. Some of your foundations come in as slabs. Um, so poor IFC implementation. I mean, that is going to change. The UK government are pushing IFC in a huge way as a file interchange format. Um, lack of standards. There are no sort of standards out there. It's, it's the Wild West at the minute. And probably the most important thing there is just check where the model came from. Um, it might say it came from Revit or it comes in as an RVT file or comes in as a PLA or PLN file. Um, make sure that's the application it was created in, that it hasn't been rooted out into another application. So this all goes down to getting access to the BIM execution plan, talking to the designers and asking them what the process they've gone through is. Um, this is what it says in the tin. Oh, lovely biscuits, chocolate biscuits. Push button, no effort, accurate, instant, quantities. That's what it, you open the tin, that's what you get. At the moment, from the QS perspective, you get a cream cracker. It will keep you alive, but without any toppings, it's not the most savoury thing in the world. I think that's what could be in the tin. There could actually be lots of chocolate biscuits in the tin for QSs if we start talking to designers. If we talk to designers, give them feedback, tell them what we need, tell them where the issues are from our perspective with BIM models. To do that, you need to start looking at BIM models. You need to invest in software. You need to invest in some training, as Claire said. You need to start making a move now, not in 2016 when everyone in the UK is miles ahead of us and when the Irish government have finally cottoned on that BIM is a good thing for the industry. 
Um, traditionally, and this is to try and put some, you're saying, well, why the hell would we invest in BIM as QSs with all of those bad points and all of those issues? And you have to invest. I mean, traditional over-the-wall design, the architect throws the drawings over the wall to the structural engineer who throws them over the wall to the service engineer. And eventually the QS gets a set of drawings and produces, uh, we cost a completed design. Um, we cost a completed design. We don't help the architect design to cost. And what BIM will do, we are going to be snowed under with architects and engineers and designers who will be able to design instead of drafting and having to draw up plans and worry about door schedules being coordinated with floor plans and elevations and sections. They're going to actually design, which is what they were trained to do and want to do. They don't want to be sitting there producing 2D outputs. BIM is going to give them the opportunity to optioneer and to design. They're going to come back to QSs and they're going to want faster quantities. They're going to want quantities more often. They're going to want more accurate prices. So you have to embrace BIM. Good thing, bad thing, warts and all, you have to get in on the act. Um, with BIM, the QS will be able to help designers design to cost. Now that might be alien to some uh, designers. Having the QS been able to steer the design and give you cost information to help you design the building. It came up at the CETA uh, BIM pilot project two years ago where we had the architects, the um, engineers all working together, designing away. The QS was able to give cost information at an early stage. An example might be where the architect has done his design, has passed it to the structural engineer, has passed it to the service engineer, but he's issued to the QS to get a, a head start on the, the, the bill of quantities. The service engineer does their analysis and it turns out, Jesus, heating and cooling the building is mad, you're going to get killed with solar again on that part of the building. Um, you need a brief in A. It's too late. The QS has issued the bill of quantities, he's issued the budget, the client has a figure in mind, you can't go back and look for more cash. So it's going to change what we do when we do it. Um, it's going to be less work for QSs, but it's less work more often. <laughs> so we're not going to come out ahead. We're going to have to do more, less work, but on a more frequent basis. Um, less work at, at tender stage preparing the bill of quantities. We'll be able to extract the quantities for BQs quicker, but we're going to have to do more work at earlier stages, extracting quantities and uh, costing more uh, design options. So it is going to balance itself out. Um, designers will be freed up to do more design options. They will want quicker and, and, and uh, more cost information. They're not going to just give us the model and say, here you go. We have to keep up. So good, bad or ugly, we have to get involved. We have to start debating, we have to start leading and giving information to designers. What does it mean? Good BIM, good BIM is less work more often. Bad BIM is more work more often. And ugly BIM is bad work. All right. So if you take even that much away, good BIM, less work but more often. Bad BIM is more work more often. You're going to have to go back and check and validate and change things. An ugly BIM is just bad work. If you know a model is ugly, stay away from it. And I'm not talking about aesthetic ugly, I'm talking about 5D or quantity ugly. Stick with your 2D, stick with your paper. I mean, I had a slide a couple of years ago I used to use in presentations of Manchester Library. It was a classical style building built in the 20s. The full design team was, was, was um, um, using BIM. QS is stuck with paper. I know why. On some projects, if the model isn't up to scratch, paper can be quicker. You know, a good QS with a scale rule can get through quantities. If the model is deficient in information, um, in some instances, paper can be, can be quicker. I'm not saying go with paper. I think you have to go with BIM. <coughs> if you encounter BIM in the wild, you know, you, you might see two different flavours. You'll see lonely BIM, where the client hasn't mandated. The designer is using BIM with their own accord. They realise they can get some benefits from using BIM. They're using it themselves. Um, in that instance, there are only two willing to work with you as a QS. Just ask the question. Ask them, what software are you using? Are you using Revit? Are you using ARCHICAD? Are you using Vectorworks? Ask the question. They will collaborate. They want people to start using their model and start getting um, the industry moving. Lonely BIM, it's normally not a project deliverable, so the client hasn't requested it, the architect is doing it or the engineer is doing it off their own bat. And there are examples at the Revit user groups of guys who are out there pushing BIM, 
not because it's the easy thing to do, but because they see that it's a better way. Usually there's a single model, and it'll probably be architecture or structure. I haven't yet seen a, a lonely sort of MVP model. Um, you just don't, don't seem to see them. Collaborative BIM, it's where the client has mandated that BIM is used on the project. Um, there'll be a number of designers using it. We'll have architecture, uh, structure, possibly MEP models. It may be a project deliverable. You, know, you may have something to produce, so you might have to hand something to the contractor. You're looking at multiple models by possibly multiple formats, more headaches. Right? But you need the software that will handle multiple models. You'll have your uh, structural model, your architectural model, your services model. BIM collaboration. This is what the, the, the vendors tell us, or this is what we interpret from the vendors' marketing material. Nirvana BIM. There's, there'll be one single model. Everyone will be cooperating. Everyone will have access to one single model. What's actually happening is that there'll be multiple models, or there'll be federated models. People will maintain their own models and will exchange them um, on a sort of frequent basis. So I think this is what you're going to see. You're going to see collaborative BIM. Uh, on projects. I, I don't see, there is Revit Server which it, it has improved dramatically over the past couple of years that allows you share Revit models, but as QS's we won't necessarily be using the native BIM file itself or the Revit file itself. So you're going to see lots of different models floating around. You need processes, you need software to manage these models. The time to do it is now, not when you have a project sitting on your doorstep, you know, screaming at you. If you encounter BIM in the wild, don't, don't use BIM wash. It's like white wash, where you say, yeah, yeah, we can do it, yeah, 4D, 5D, we have the software, we have, and you haven't. I've done it myself in the past, where I've used BIM wash. Likely, not, not you know, a, a big dose of it, but don't use BIM wash. Ask questions. Everyone is starting out on the road with BIM. Nobody expects anyone to have 20 years experience with BIM in, in the construction sector. Um, Establish what BIM software is being used. Ask the question, what are you using to create your models? That will give you an indication as to where you might have some potential sort of problems. So ask the question. Uh, assess the usability for quantity takeoff before making any promises. So don't just say a BIM model, great, we can, uh, yeah, we can use that. You might only be able to use it for visualization. You may not be able to take quantities out. So don't give a price for producing quantities from a BIM model when you haven't seen it. Right. Try and assess it or try and have a look at some of the architects or engineers' work before you actually commit to producing quantities from the model itself. Um, just because it's producing BIM software doesn't mean it's usable for quantity takeoff. BIM execution plan sounds like a very fancy, very scary document. It can be one paragraph, it can be a couple of lines, it can be a very extensive document. All it does, it sets out what software individuals are using, what versions of software they're using how models will be exchanged, what the deliverables are from the design team, um, whether quantity takeoff is a deliverable, whether clash detection is a deliverable. So first thing as a QS I would ask for on projects is, is there a BIM execution plan? See the pilot project, BIM execution plan? Um, look for the BIM execution plan. Very simple, just ask the question, is there a BIM execution plan? It will save a lot of headaches. Uh, BIM workflows. Now, these are the workflows that I've sort of been working with, so they're not perfect. Um, I know that they've worked for me in the past, so... Uh, who, what and when. To get some information on it, have a look at the RII BIM execution plan. There was a draft copy I saw a couple of months back. It looked like a very good document. The Royal Institute of British Architects have just produced a new RIBA plan of work with a BIM skin. It's worth having a look at to see where the UK industry is going with work stages and how they're changing their work practices. Um, and this is a superb set of documents. It's from a, a crowd called Building Smart in Finland. They've got a series of documents that go from service engineers, architects, quantity surveyors, contractors on the BIM process. And they explain in very, very simple details in English, not, not Finnish, um, what BIM is and how it actually works. So have a look at those documents. They've got a very good document on quantity takeoff. It's about 20 pages. So they give you how BIM projects should actually work or how they should run. Um, if, you, if you just Google Core BIM 2012, you'll get the full series of documents. It's the finished branch of Building Smart. 
BIM does not resolve quantity takeoff related issues exhaustively. And not all quantities needed during a project can be taken off from a BIM. The professional skill of a quantity specialist is still needed for assessing the validity of the source data and source materials, ensuring the coverage of the takeoff, proposing alternative solutions, and analysing results. So, QS is still needed to vet and to validate models, digital verification. Um, two reactions you meet on the ground when you go into companies and you're doing some BIM work. You'll meet fear. The junior surveyors, the mid-level surveyors who are there doing the takeoffs, you'll encounter fear. And at a management level, you'll have unrealistic expectations. They'll hear there's BIM and they've read a bit about it and they think you push a button and you get a bit of quantities. And to illustrate it, in terms of fear, working on a project that produced uh, mechanical quantities, 12,000 line spreadsheet, which I passed on to the, the mechanical QS, um, looked at it for a couple of minutes and came back and said, the model is wrong. It's called up the wrong ductwork for these systems. This ductwork should be Teflon lined. Several hundred thousand euros of a mistake in the model where the modeler had picked the wrong system from a drop down list. So it was validation by a human, a QS, that picked up that error. Same QS the next day, pipe work, the wrong valves. 300 euros a valve on the model, three grand in reality. And in the next cubicle, quarter to five the same evening, a couple of surveyors, electrical surveyors, oh, we have to measure this um, containment. Several thousand metres of containment had to be measured that evening. Could I do anything? Was it in the BIM? Sat down, extracted the quantities within 10 minutes, and they were gobsmacked. They thought, we're finished, we're out of work. They're still there six months later because they have to validate. They have to validate. They're validating quantities coming out of the models. So it's fear and unrealistic expectations. You need to try and counter those two things in, the organ in any organisation. First step, just to reiterate again, look at the BIM execution plan or the model spec. Consistency of modelling is a very important sort of aspect or attribute from the QS perspective. That stuff is modelled consistently in different parts of the building. Um, the level of detail is, is, should be standard throughout the building. Modelling methods should be documented. Okay, so, BIM execution plan, look for it. Um, 2D work stages, you're probably all familiar with this document. It's buried in um, the National Standard Building Elements or Design Cost Control Procedures, which was developed in the, I think it was the mid to late 70s by Enforest Forbaha. Uh, it hasn't changed since. So, I think we do need to change. We need to update. We need to look at the RIBA work plan of work. We need to look at the BIM skin. Um, and basically, this just sets out the workflow, what we do when we actually do it. The traditional workflow, we take our 2D plans, we take our rules of measurement, be it the ARM or SMM7 or CIMIC or POMI, that wonderful document that was here for a couple of years. We take the specification. Um, we create construction recipes. So we create a recipe which says that concrete column has so many cubic metres of concrete, it has so many kgs of rebar, it has so many square metres of formwork. So we create a recipe based on the specification rules of measurement and we apply that to the design quantities and we get construction quantities or component quantities. We apply our unit costs, we get our estimate or a cost plan or a BQ. So that's a very simple representation of the sort of QS workflow. We interpret the plans and specs, we identify um, and classify objects and items. We do, as, as Claire said, we do a, a clash detection, sort of paper-based clash detection. We go through the model, we get a feel for the project or the job itself. Um, we compress the, de and ironically or frustratingly, we compress the detail takeoff into a bill of quantities in accordance with the standard method of measurement. And we send out to the contractor, you need 100 tonnes of steel beams in this project. Even though we've gone along as QS, and we've probably measured floor by floor, and we know that on the 16th floor there's 20 tonne of steel beams. And rather than give the, 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 Q, the contractor a granular document that he could price with a strategic price and could say, well, on the 16th floor it's going to cost me two grand a tonne to place that steel, but it means the rate I use on the ground floor is only a thousand because I can place it from a teleport. So we don't do ourselves any favours there, but I think BIM will allow us to produce location-based quantities. The BIM work stages, yeah, we still have to work to that document. Same work stages. The format and level of detail of information we receive uh, will change fundamentally. So it's not a set of static plans. It's, 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 a, it's a model which has, can have a different level of detail. Budgets, estimates and cost plans will be required probably to produce them quicker and update them more often. Um, 
we still need a bit of quantities. I mean, for the first while I worked with BIM, I was thinking, we won't need a bit of quantities. It's a dead document. You just price a model. <coughs> You're not going to just price a model. The bill of quantities is a scoping document. It's pulling all of this disparate information together in one sort of a format. Um, at the moment, we can't produce similar quantities automatically from models. Um, the ARM, the rules of measurement, don't necessarily lend themselves very easily to taking off in that format. Um, you can produce bills, you extract your quantities, you have your standard template, be it in cost sex or bill soft, and you pull your quantities into it. But it's not push for button producibility of quantities. Um, more work at an earlier stage and more often. Will the speed gains at bill of quantity stage be used up in earlier stage of costing design options? I think they will. The BIM workflow, we have our models. So this is a purely 3D workflow. Rules of measurement, specification, construction recipes. The important thing is construction quantities. The architect schedules won't give us construction quantities. They will give us design quantities. They'll give us the quantities required for the finished product not necessarily the construction quantities. It's not going to give us the formwork. It's not going to give us the um, length of skirtings or stuff that isn't modelled. We need to produce the construction quantities. Unit costs, we produce our bill of quantities. Just in terms of BIM quantities, designers building information models will produce design quantities, not construction quantities. I was speaking to, to guys earlier on and they were saying that, well, not everything will be modelled. It won't show you, will show you one long wall. It won't break it up into individual sections. Contractors need to go in and change models and add in construction joints or add in particular details. So they need to render design models into what they call means and methods models. And shock horror, models are still full of 2D details. It's not all 3D. Not everything is modelled. We've got three types of quantities. We've got quantities based on model items, the number of doors, the volume of concrete and columns. Quantities derived from model items. Um, we can work out the, the area or length of architrave um, from the details in there for the door. We can work out the formwork for columns from the girth and height of the column. Um, we'll have non-model quantities. Construction joints and concrete slabs, shoring, pinning, a lot of stuff like that. So, if you are getting a model from a, from a designer, always ask them for the 2D outputs as well. Always get the 2D drawings uh, or 2D documents with the model. Trying to navigate your way through a large project in 3D only is, is mental. It, it, that stadium project in the Middle East, we only had the 3D model. Um, trying to navigate through and trying to find your way, and it's amazing how many times you, you can get lost in, in, in a virtual space. You have to hit the home button and try and figure out well, where was I when I was on that last element. So always ask for the 2D documents as well. Don't decommission your scale rule. Right? You're going to still need it for a while. And yeah, you will have to do some, some 2D measurement. It's going to be a hybrid workflow where you'll have to combine 2D and 3D. You're going to have some 2D outputs. Maybe the mechanical designer is working from, uh, from 2D. The key it's having a tool that will allow you to do both in one box. It's having something that will allow you to do pure two-dimensional, two will allow you to do 2D and 3D, will allow you to do pure BIM mod 3D models only. So there are a number of tools out there. I use Costex. It does the 2D, does the, the 3D stuff. Um, an area where a lot of BIM models tend to stop, civil structure and architectural models, they tend not to do groundworks. They, uh, they seem to forget about stuff in the ground. I mean, Billsoft have a great product called Mudshark, which for doing any sort of groundworks from models or 2D plans is another great bit of software that I've used in the past. Um, you're going to have designers using 2D only. You'll have mixed design teams. A project a couple of years back, MEP was done on paper. It was hand sketched. There was no 2D outputs, no PDFs, no DWGs. Oh, that slide was stuck in twice. MEP workflows. This is a critical area for anyone working, any MEP QSs. Define or find out at the start of the, the project what role single line diagrams, uh, PFDs and PNIDs play. Are they going to be updated as the, uh, as the BIM is actually updated or changed? You need to validate the BIM against schematics. Um, you need to review and check systems against what's modelled in the BIM. Will the schematics change as the model changes? Electrical cable, haven't seen it modelled yet. You still need to go and get the schedule. Um, 
Does the model allow you to measure in accordance with the rules of measurement? Most models will allow you to measure pipe from fitting to fitting. The measurement rules generally measure true fittings and you extra over the fittings. So you need to sort that out in advance. What are you going to do? How are you going to work it? Civil structural architectural workflows. Review the BIM execution plan. Review BIM. Validate, validate, validate. <coughs> Review the 2D details. Uh, is there 2D scope? Big issue on some projects. There will be 2D scope in one section of the building and 3D in another. There's an interface between them. You need to try and figure out the demarcation. Are there overlaps? Is there stuff in both? Um, I've started developing a BIM risk register. So I'll, at the start of the project, sit down, document where the possible conflicts or issues are um, and, and how you can handle them, how you can check. Um, just going to skip through this stuff. The, I think the presentation will be available. I think we've run out, come to the end there. That was really just going through file types. Two principal file types QSs will use. We're not going to really use the native model files. Software is expensive um, and very, very large file formats. They're not read-only, so you can go in and delete stuff inadvertently. DWFX is an Autodesk format that's, that's, that's open, it's available, and IFC. They're the two formats that you will be receiving model files in. So you need to be familiar with the process and instructing architects on how to create a DWFX that's usable. Older versions of Revit, if they create a DWFX, by default it didn't export the quantities. There was a checkbox they had to check. So you could get a lovely model with no quantities. It was just a checkbox in Revit they needed to check. Later versions have that sorted out. The same with IFC. If they're exporting IFC, excuse me, they need to export base quantities with the model. So you can get a dumb model with no sort of uh, no quantities, just pretty pictures. Um, just in terms of the different softwares, these are all the different versions of software you might encounter. It's a limited set of them. And you'll have people, you have to try and get stuff from different applications. Um, from a QS perspective, it'll be IFC or it will be DWFX into CostX or into whatever other application you're using. If you're buying software, you need to look for software that can handle IFC or has plans to handle IFC. You know, that you need to just check in advance. Navisworks, super tool from a QS perspective to allow you to go and validate, has some quantity takeoff features now as well. It's expensive, but you pay for, you know. Just want to watch Open BIM. It's a, an open IFC organization. Free tools, Tecla BIM site, Brilliant tool for viewing and clash detecting IFC models. Um, Celebri model viewer. There's a utility there for anyone who's wedded to Excel, which will allow you to convert a model purely into a, an Excel format. Various BIM servers. Uh, Autodesk design review. Superb bit of software. If you just do one thing today, go out and download design review and try and get a couple of sample models in design review format. It's free, allows you a red line, allows you to do some very, very basic sort of um, on screen measurements. Navisworks Freedom, another very good tool for viewing uh, models and viewing DWFX files. The QS BIM toolbox, you need a BIM and a 2D measurement application. I'm um, just saying go for a destination application, go for something where your quantities stay, you don't have to route them into something else. BIM investigation tool, Navisworks, it's been a lifesaver for me on projects where you're trying to find stuff that doesn't fit or find objects that don't have lengths or don't have volumes. So you know in advance before you measure, these are the things I have to watch out for. And just some of the review tools. Um, costs. You're looking at, I would think, to gear yourself up with, with a good, high-quality PC uh, and the software, you won't have any change out of five grand, I think. Um, you need to buy something now. I mean, that PC will probably do you for three, four years, five years. Um, the software, that's approximate, approximately three grand. If you have um, an organization, you've got a couple of licenses, Get a mixture of 2D and 3D licenses. You, know, you can upgrade them at some stage. Get a couple of 3D, get most of them as 3D, put them on a network. And I think training is, is, is vital. And a website, just have a look at. If you still need to know what or why BIM, BIM for SMEs, it's a UK government's website for SMEs on BIM. It's quite good. And uh, finally, I think BIM does open up new opportunities for QSs. Life cycle costing, which we've been promising for 20 years, carbon costing. Living cost plans, waste management, coordination, constructability, clash detection, model validation, verification. Technological problems are temporary and can be bypassed by process and people. So software isn't perfect, neither are we, but we can overcome issues by thinking about the process and people. We need to engage with BIM users and promoters, counter the myth we're afraid of BIM. I'm not afraid of BIM, I'm afraid of bad BIM. Uh, doesn't scare me, bad BIM scares me. 
and uh, why the Western team title? It is like the Bim Wild West out there at the minute. New frontier, lots of opportunities for the first settlers. So I would get out, start claiming, claiming land. It is going to be a sort of a gold rush. There's not much law and order out there when it comes to Bim at the moment. You'll meet lots of cowboys and Indians, <laughs> peasant company included, right? Um, wild Bim horses, Bernard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Other possible titles, if the vendors were titling the presentation, fistful of dollars, or might be for a few dollars more. Right? Uh, Ralph Tarantino Montague was the director. It'd be Montague Unchained. <laughs> if tweets were bullets, we'd all be dead. <laughs> for anyone starting the BIM journey, true grit. You need a bit of true grit to get through the process. And uh, just to finish off. Oh. <coughs> Sorry, that, that did, didn't run there, but sure. Sorry, just wait for one second here. Thanks very much, folks.